Hi everybody, welcome back to the 10th of an hour with Griffin Bridgers. For this episode 24, we're going to address a non-tax topic. We're going to look more at privacy in estate planning, uh, especially digging in on the revocable trust and other issues that can, uh, in theory, provide privacy, but in execution don't always provide the level of privacy that was expected. As always, this presentation is not intended to be legal or tax advice, so you should consult with an attorney or ad tax advisor before implementing these strategies. So, some of you may have heard of revocable living trust, some of you may not have, but typically when you create an estate plan, the traditional method for disposing of your assets at death is the will, which in, in addition to beneficiary designations, as we previously discussed, will give away most of your property, but Another technique involves the use of a revocable living trust, which essentially replaces the dispositive terms of your will. And there's two common objectives. Often the most sold objective is avoidance of court interference in two ways. This can help you avoid probate to the extent that the revocable living trust is funded during life or by beneficiary designation at death. And during life, it could also help you avoid a conservatorship to the extent that the revocable living trust is funded by you by asset transfers prior to disability or incapacity, or to the extent that the trust is funded maybe by an agent or attorney in fact under a durable power of attorney. Now the second objective, which kind of is closely tied to probate avoidance, is privacy of affairs because if a probate estate is opened on your behalf, anybody can go search that, be it a creditor, uh, a journalist, any sort of interested party you don't want to know about your death or about your financial affairs could potentially snoop around. So for a lot of people out there, privacy isn't that big of a concern, but for uh, an increasing percentage of the population, it is. Now, it's important to note that only the terms of the revocable living trust may be private. So usually the will is lodged with the court as part of the probate process and could be searched for by an interested party or even an uninterested party, depending on the state and the level of sealing of records within the probate itself. So while the terms of your will could be public, the terms of the revocable living trust may not be private. However, what you cannot keep private is often the existence of the trust and also real estate that might be owned by the trust. And similarly, business entities, whether or not those business entities are associated with the revocable trust. And one reason that this is important is that even if probate is avoided, your revocable trust assets don't necessarily avoid claims of creditors because most state laws say that the claims of creditors that have um, outstanding debts you owe them at the time of your death first will be satisfied from the probate estate. Now a fully funded revocable trust avoids the existence of a probate estate, but if a creditor goes prying, they can use revocable living trust assets to satisfy their debts if there's no probate estate assets available to satisfy those debts, unless the assets are exempt from creditor claims anyway, which is a whole other discussion. But then when it comes to privacy, there's a few issues that are often overlooked by those who tout the privacy benefits of revocable trusts. And you and your client should be aware of this, or if you are a client considering a revocable trust, these are things to keep in mind as well. First off, under Colorado law and under the law of a lot of states, placing real estate in a revocable trust can breach your privacy because it creates a searchable deed record. So right now, if you own real estate, uh, a lot of Clerk and recorder um, records are online and can be searched by anybody who has an interest. They can go in and find what property you might own uh, through the clerk and recorder website or even through the uh, tax assessor website. And if you create a deed transferring the property to your trust, then the existence of that trust can also be confirmed by anybody who searches for that information. 
Even worse, a statement of authority must be recorded, which may show your name as trustee if you are the trustee of the trust, which shows that even if the trust name is not associated with you, that you personally could be associated with the trust. And then often, a revocable trust will just simply use your first or last name. So for example, if I were to create one, I could just use the Griffin Bridgers Revocable Trust, and obviously in that case, uh, the trust can easily be discovered as well. So if you want to keep your trust and the existence of that trust completely private and not associated with you, some common uh, tips and tricks would be using an unidentifiable trust name that's not associated with your name. One, you may want to consider just taking title to newly purchased real estate in the name of the trust so that you don't have any sort of initial deed and transfer deed with your name on it as grantor. Another thing you could consider is, even though there is a cost to this, you could name an unrelated third party or a trust company as trustee, somebody whose name can't necessarily be traced to you because your business arrangement with that trustee would be kept private as well. Now with business entities, it's important to note that this also creates another area where privacy can be breached, mainly because to create a business entity, you have to file with the Colorado Secretary of State, if it's a Colorado entity, and a lot of other states have their own Secretary of State or Division of Corporations that requires a filing as well to create the entity. And this filing can tie your name to the entity typically is the filing party or the registered agent or both. So while we're going to look at ways that you can conceal your ties to a business entity, it's important to note as well that usually the purpose behind a business entity is to shield your personal assets from any claims against the business entity. And if it shows that the two of you are alter egos and there's really no distinction between you and the entity, then that could create grounds to pierce the limited liability veil of the entity itself. Now, that, that's kind of a double-edged sword, and one thing a lot of people don't uh, really consider, and while this is kind of an out there fact or occurrence, it's something to think about, where if you go to too great a length to conceal the existence of your entity, that may be something that a creditor could look at in a court and say, hey, that really shows, um, you know, facts and circumstances that would justify piercing the limited liability veil of the entity, or it could show an intent to defraud creditors, which would allow a creditor to potentially reverse any transfers of assets that you make to that entity itself. But those issues aside, it's also important to note that the same deed record concerns that come up with revocable living trusts could also arise with the entity because whoever the highest officer or manager of the entity might be who signs deeds or statements of authority will be revealed through a search of the, the deed records or even the assessor website. So a lot of the tips here are similar to the ones we looked at with revocable trust. Uh, you could consider using an unrelated registered agent for the entity, although that usually has a cost associated with it. If an attorney is forming the entity, you may wish to consider having them identify their firm or the attorney themselves as the filing party instead of naming you as the filing party. Another thing you could consider is uh, don't use your first and or last name as part of the name of the entity because that using your name would, would create closer ties to you as well. And then finally, if you're going to do any sort of deeds or statements of authority, you might want to consider having an unrelated manager, at least under a temporary delegation, who can sign off on those records that will become public entity. Now, by no means are those uh, solutions or issues all inclusive of the privacy concerns that can arise with revocable living trusts or with business entities, but this at least gives you a certain level of awareness to, to keep top of mind if privacy is a concern when you're engaging in any sort of estate planning or business planning. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. But thank you for listening to this episode of the 10th of an hour, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.